What do Taylor Swift and Kelly Clarkson have in common? Well, they both make an appearance on today's episode, and it turns out they have some pretty good career advice to share. This week, we are meeting with Ashleisha, who works in consultant relations in the asset management industry in Asia. Ash shares with us all about her area of expertise, her career journey, and she has some great advice for us too. We also talk about why it is important to be mindful of the lifestyle you want to lead when considering your career options. We talk about the benefit of extracurricular activities and networks on personal development at work. We talk about navigating rejection in sales and relationship management roles. We talk about diversity, equity and inclusion in the industry and that while there's more to do, there's also lots to celebrate. And of course, we talk about the power of self-belief and perseverance, because as Kelly Clarkson says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Enjoy the show. Ash, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on your bank holiday Monday as well. (laughs) My pleasure. I'm really excited to do a deep dive into your area of expertise and learn more about your career journey so far. So thank you so much. How about we get started? Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do and how long you've been doing it for? Great. Okay. Um, So, yeah, so I um, cover consultant relations for Asia for T. Rowe Price, which is a global asset manager. Uh, I've been in the investment industry for coming up to 10 years this August now. So I can't believe it's been a decade already. Um, And I've been at T. Rowe Price for nearly four years. Um, I am based in Singapore, so I'm not in the UK. Uh, I used to live in the UK and work in the UK for the first seven years uh, of my asset management career. Um, And then I relocated out to Singapore just before the pandemic. Wow. Thank you very much. Okay, Ash, this is a podcast. So I'm wondering if you like podcasts and if so, what are you enjoying right now? Gosh, I love podcasts. I think I'm actually a bit addicted to them. You know, I just (laughs) feel that they're the perfect backdrop for a commute for exercising when you're cooking when you're just cleaning um so definitely a big podcast fan (laughs) um I have lots of favorite podcasts so I'm really going to struggle to name one (laughs) that I love uh listening to um but I think Desert Island Discs is an all-time favorite for me which I always have on the go whenever the new one comes out um And then I love informative podcasts. So I love these, you know, uh, BBC podcasts, which do like a deep dive into um, a new story that's going on. Um, And then I also really love uh, How to Fail by Elizabeth Day. So Mm. that's probably, that's actually the one I was just listening to just this morning. Um, And I just love the idea that she's got about, you know, turning failures into something that should be celebrated and yeah. what do you actually learn from each failure and how does it define you so I, do, I really like yeah. the way she's just really challenged this whole conception that society has around failing um yeah oh I love all of those three sets of podcasts so a uh, similar rotation <laughs> to me and you're right I think that you know, so I think certainly, you know, in some cultures growing up, f- failure was seen as such a bad thing, wasn't it? You can't fail. But actually, yeah, exactly that. Her podcast shows that actually, you know, we learn. That's how we learn. If we don't fail, we don't learn. And there's there's quite a nice um, expression um, that spells out the word fail. It's called uh, it's uh, first attempt in learning, which I think is really a nice way of thinking oh, about I like failure. That. Oh. That's yeah, really nice way of thinking about it. I've never heard that. No, yeah. and I was going to say, I mean, the other reason why I love podcasts and like how much the industry has really grown is, you know, not everyone loves reading, not everyone loves yeah. watching TV, right? But so it's just, it's another yeah. avenue for people to learn content and I think broaden their horizons in a way that maybe works for them a bit more as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's such a good point because everybody yeah. has different learning styles, don't they? So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Let's get on to your area of expertise, Ash. Consultant relations, so many misconceptions about the work we do. So tell us what that actually means. And actually, perhaps tell us about the common misconceptions of consultant relations first. 
so there are so many misconceptions it's um <laughs> yeah I mean I I still am not convinced that everyone I know knows what I do to be honest I think yeah um you know I think because uh, you look at the term consultant right and it can apply to so yeah. many different jobs so you can be a management yeah. consultant you could be like a consultant for a company where you're you know you're not a permanent employee but you're kind of being paid at a, at a fixed yeah. rate by the hour um yeah you could be like an HR like an L&D consultant like there's just so many different I think jobs that go under consultant so the particular type of consultant that I work with um is the investment consulting community and mm-hmm. and then relations the second half of that job is kind of what it says um you're the relationship manager with the investment consultants so I think before I go into what my job actually entails maybe we take a bit of a step back and um, I appreciate that a lot of people don't actually know what investment consultants are um yeah. so I'll just spend a minute or two just explaining that thank you um so the world of finance is huge uh you know I honestly, on a weekly basis, still learn about new functions and new roles. And it just, it still never ceases to amaze me how big the finance ecosystem actually is. You know, how many jobs there are, um, how many different firms there are that kind of make up the food chain. And the investment consulting um, part of it is pretty important part actually of the finance uh, world so essentially um what investment consultants do and I might use a bit of a analogy that I've trialed with a few people uh, and hopefully yeah. it has uh, similar <laughs> results for you um so I would take one step back and you know Joe you have been given a lump sum of 100 million pounds and you know that you shouldn't keep it in a savings account because it's not really going to earn much interest. And so you're like, OK, I need to invest this hundred million pounds, but I don't have the investment expertise, nor do I have the desire to do it. And I actually don't know who to invest it in because there are so many firms out there with so many products. Like, how do I know yeah. which firms to invest my hundred million pounds with? Right. So, you know, I'd say you, hypothetically you and a lot of, you know, individual investors would probably logically go to a gatekeeper, like a financial advisor, right? So the financial advisor essentially has done all their due diligence on what products are out there in the market, which firms are really good at the specific products. And they've probably come up with this list um, of like preferred providers that they would recommend to their end clients like you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'd go to your financial advisor and you'd say, I've got a hundred million pounds. I don't know how to invest it. However, this is my risk tolerance. And by that, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, do you like investing in risky assets with the possibility that you might actually end up losing most of your money, but then you could also gain even more than you originally thought, right? Because it's a risky yeah. asset. Or are you a bit, you know, risk shy. And so you're a risk of us investor. And so the financial advisor will kind of help you work out your risk tolerance. And then what they'll also do is try and work out with you, okay, you've got this 100 million pounds. What's your goal? Like, what do you want to get out of this 100 million pounds? And in what time frame? And so say if, you know, you said to them, okay, I've got 100 million, I want this to grow to 110 million in five years time. Yeah. There you go. You've got your and and you say to them, I'm not particularly like I don't really want to invest in risky assets too much. Right. So there you've got your risk appetite and your return expectations. And then so what they would do based on that and, you know, a few other factors. is come up with a proposed asset allocation uh, mix view. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that could be something like, Joe, we think you should invest 50 million in equities, 30 million in bonds and 20 million in other stuff. And then so if we take a step back, look at that 50 million in equities, what they're going to do is then say, okay, Joe, we think that, okay, you want to invest 50 million in global equities. There are about 600 products out there, but these are the six best ones that we think suit you, right? Yeah. What that's automatically done for you is it's whittled down this huge, slightly overwhelming universe of so many different products and managers. 
And that's been the role of the financial advisor. Like they've simplified what is potentially an enormously vast ecosystem out there that you don't really know much about. And yeah. so then what has happened is these six firms that they've recommended to you, you it's just expedited this, this firm's chance of winning your money, right? Like you wouldn't know about them yeah. before if it wasn't for this yeah. financial advisor. So now let's take a step back. And that's on a individual investor, mm-hmm. financial advisor example. Yeah. Take a step back and think about, you know, huge companies who have massive pension schemes and loads of people who are expecting their pensions to be paid out. You've got endowments, yes. charities, foundations. These are all examples of institutional clients. So they're institutions mm-hmm. with huge pots of money. And yeah. like you, with your return expectation and your risk tolerance, these institutional clients also have the same thing, but just on a much yeah. bigger scale, right? So they need the help even more. And so they're basically going to the institutional equivalent of a financial advisor, uh, which is an investment yeah. consultant. And so mm-hmm. what the so the investment consultant is technically still the middleman or the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is they're saying, this is what we want. Who are the best managers out there? What's your like, what's your list of preferred managers that you recommend to me? And so my job is to make sure that all of the products that are in my remit are basically yeah. making their way onto this middleman's preferred providers list so that we are expediting yeah. our chances of winning institutional money. So I work really closely with, you know, our sales team, with the investment team. We're all working yeah. super. So the sales team will be working on the end client. I'm trying to influence, mm-hmm. you know, the, the gatekeeper in the middle. Yeah. And then once you've got a product onto that preferred providers list it's managing yeah. that relationship afterwards and making sure the product stays on that list got it well, that's really helpful thank you and i think it's really nice how you give us the breakdown of a a, a i guess a retail client like you or me and an institutional mm. client and also to show how the path is similar and that the that that investment consultant is the equivalent of that financial advisor. That's super helpful. <clears throat> and Ash, can I ask you, typically where would the investment co- consultant work? What what kind of organization would they work for? So you have specialist um investment consulting organizations. Um, you yeah. know, the UK, for example, uh has a lot of UK specific consulting organizations so uh yeah. lane clark and peacock uh barnett waddingham hymans robertson they're three yeah. uk-based consultants that i can think of but then yeah. you know as with any as with any business line you have local players and then you have global players and so yeah. you know the biggest consultants out there in terms of how much money they're advising right so remember the consultant yeah. is advising on money um, yeah. So that Mercer, Aon, Willis House Watson, Cambridge Associates, yeah. you know, they're four of the big ones that I can think of, which yeah. they operate in multiple countries. Um, you know, they have teams in multiple locations, even within one country. Um, yeah. And they're influencing millions and millions of money. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a. Uh, it's interesting because I think the market dynamics in terms of investment behaviors are very different. Mm. And I think this is something that I've had the privilege of witnessing, having done this job in the UK and now in yeah. Asia. And you know, Asia is such a big region, like the market dynamics of Japan are very different to what's going on in Singapore. And so it's really yeah. interesting for me to see, OK, the investment consultant role is essentially the same in you know these different locations. But actually, yeah. my day to day interactions with them in Asia are very different to what I was doing in the UK based on what the overall market is doing in these two different ge- uh, geographical yeah. locations. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. And one question that's springing to mind. We hear a lot about direct to consumer. So the the consumer mm-hmm. can go straight to the asset owner I guess or the asset manager Mm -hmm. is is there such a thing as the institution going straight to the asset owner and almost 
I guess that you know that the, the role of the middle person is not required. Is that a thing, or does most of the institutional money yeah. travel through the investment consultant? Yeah, I think that's a very very good question, actually. Um, so I'd say it really depends on where in the world you are. Um, yeah. I'd say somewhere in the UK, for example, about ninety percent of all institutional money is influenced in some capacity by an investment consultant. Now yeah. that's it's nowhere near that level in Asia because I guess the the evolution of the role of the consultant is still not as developed as it is in somewhere like the UK or the US. And I think the main reason why I still think the role of a consultant is very important in institutional money. Um, by the way, I would caveat consultants also influence private bank money and some retail mm. money as well, or they're not as much Got as it. institutions. Um, why I think it's still important is, you know, it's, it's kind of like that that third party stamp of approval, right? So even like, say, for example, yeah. even when you're buying a house, you could go and look at the house yourself, mm. you know, do yeah. a, like minutia inspection of everything that's going on in the house. But when you yeah. get a surveyor to come in and give you that stamp of approval, you just have that, I think, that sense of confidence that the decision that you're making yeah. has also independently been verified by someone else. And yeah. I think that's where, that's why I think the role of the con investment consultants are still quite important because, you know, that we're not looking at one or two million pounds, right? We're looking at yeah. huge cash pods here. And yeah. so I think for a lot of the institutions, they A, don't have the investment experience in-house themselves. Yeah. And B, you know, like I said, hiring a Aon, for example, it, I think it just gives them a sense of, calmness that okay the, yeah the, there is someone who this is their bread and butter they know what they're doing and so this has been their recommendation to us and yeah. then in a way we have to hold them accountable for delivering on it as well right so it's, yeah uh, I yeah. think there's yeah there's that element of it yeah. as well yeah and like you say when we're talking about institutional money for example you know often it is that big pension pot and therefore you know that's a lot yeah. of people's futures in your hands and you have to make sure that it is um yeah um protected as 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 best as possible yeah yeah exactly I mean this that that's you know one of the things that I find so fascinating about the industry that I'm in is that this is people's retirement that we're working with yeah. like this isn't just a you know holiday fund or <laughs> yeah. know, a bonus yeah. one year or something like this is literally yeah. people's you know retirement outcomes that they are trusting us with and yeah. so that's that's the part that I've always found quite I guess meaningful about what I do mm. is that I'm yes I am a very small dot in this huge food chain that is ultimately yeah. hopefully gonna give you know my my parents or my parents generation or you know equivalent a good retirement because they've trusted yeah. us to do so yeah yeah thank you so much so if <laughs> I'm if I'm understanding it correctly and and um, please correct me if I've misinterpreted but your organization relies on you and your team to build relationships with these investment consultants to not only get on the list but to stay on the list mm -hmm. correct yeah and sometimes the latter can be a bit harder than the former because <laughs> you know as we all know um once you've won something keeping it is actually sometimes even more challenging right so uh yeah, yeah but correct and so I, I I'm the only one who does my role for my team in Asia uh, but yeah. we are a global team um, and, you know, similar organizations would have similar team structures as well, where they'd have yeah, essentially, you know, the same, like, the same job, but it would look very different based on where geographically you're based. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, often I ask the guests to give us an industry overview. And and actually, I think it would be really nice to have a, a bit of an overview of the asset management industry in Asia, if that's something you could share with us. Yeah, so look, it's super different uh, to, I guess, the US, the UK. Again, the UK for me is my most direct comparison, having, you know, done yeah. essentially a very similar role in the UK. 
Um, I think the thing I find very interesting about Asia is it's lumped together as one region, but take mm. a step back and, you know, you've got China, you've got Japan, yeah. you've got South Korea, you've got Hong Kong, you've got Singapore, and then you've got the more emerging economies like Malaysia or the Philippines or Indonesia. And they're just so different in terms of, firstly, I think where they are in in terms of their own growth rate as an economy mm. in a country. Yeah. So, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan, for example, are a lot more wealthier and probably yeah. a lot further along the retirement journey than somewhere like Malaysia and Indonesia, which are more, you know, emerging mm. countries. And they're really just starting yeah. to, I think, get their get their feet on the ground and I think you know have other countries realize that they're a serious contender for the future so yeah. it, it is super different because I think in the UK firstly it's such a developed market people mm-hmm. have been investing there you know in it and from it for a very long time yeah. it's it, it it's just it's very easy I think to work out what the trends are in the UK whereas in Asia you really have to look at it on a country by country basis And so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore and Japan, for example, being slightly more experienced investors, I think they tend to um, they tend to have more, I think, companies located there. Uh, I think their general level of investment experience is a lot uh, further along the journey, whereas I think Mm. Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, are still very much in the nascent stages um, from what I've seen. Uh, but, yeah. you know, that's very much changing. I mean, I think um, people are starting to make dedicated allocations to Thailand or Indonesia, for example, mm. which never would have happened, you know, five to seven years yeah. ago. Um, whereas dedicated allocations to Hong Kong and Singapore were already happening 10 years ago. So I think yeah. Asia's, I think the next five to seven years in Asia is going to be a very um, pivotal, yeah, pivotal time of the mm. investment journey Um and yeah, I'm really, I'm actually really An excited exciting to time. be here and actually witness it from the ground. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And yeah. just to see, you know, will China, like, will China continue to grow? Will India increase mm. in its, you know, um, size and I guess influence that it has on the region? You know, will the Philippines, Malaysia and Indonesia continue to grow at the rate that they're doing right now? I think, it, I think it's going to yeah. be interesting. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. All right. Ash, if we zoom into an average week, what might we find you doing if we were fly on the wall? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I don't think I really have an average week. And I think that's basically what I really like about my job. Um, yeah, I get bored quick. I get bored quite quickly. and This is something I identified in myself a very long time ago. So I think this is one of the reasons that, you know, this function really suits me is because there yeah. are like no two days that are the same. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it would be it would be a combination of preparing for any upcoming external meetings I've got, whether I'm doing yeah. that by myself or whether I'm doing that, you know, with a fund manager. Um, yeah. It would be maybe having a couple of informal coffee catch ups with, you know, one of my clients, you know, just getting to, either yeah. getting to know them a bit more or we're trying to, you know, address a certain topic in particular. Yeah. Um I do quite a lot of events at work so um you know prepping for the events I think the event follow-up that takes up quite a lot of time and then yeah internal meetings so like I said I'm the only one that is um representing my team in the region here Mm. so you know I am essentially the voice of my team for a lot of the teams that we work with and so you know giving business updates I think hearing any queries that other teams might have that I need to escalate to the rest of my global team um, yeah. And so I, I always actually think like, you know, my role is predominantly a cl- external client facing role, but I yeah. feel I'm also responsible for bringing the market, like the particular market that I cover to my colleagues yeah. internally and also being that segue for them. Um, yeah. So I would actually say it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, equal mix of external mm. and internal relationship management. Yeah. Yeah, because it sounds like you're the eyes and ears on the ground. So you bring those that kind of knowledge Correct. and awareness yeah. back inside. So the information flows two ways almost, which sounds really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's 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 an underrated thing that I think a lot of people don't talk about. But I think 
managing your internal relationships is as important as managing your external relationships. And I think that's yeah. something that everyone just focuses on. Oh, you've got to be amazing to your client, but no, you've got to be equally amazing to your colleagues because when you need stuff done, <laughs> you need to make sure yeah. you have a good relationship with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm get I'm getting the impression you're probably collaborating with quite a lot of teams internally to be able to take the information externally. So, yeah. you know, who, who are the major teams that you're collaborating and tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So you're 100 percent right in that the, this is definitely not a one man job. Um, I really require a lot of collaboration with you know not just the teams in Singapore and Hong Kong um, but globally so um, we work really closely with the sales guys Um, you know obviously if there's if there's a client that they're trying to pitch to that is being influenced by one of the consultants that I work with then we work Mm. very closely with them Um, I obviously work very closely with the investment team for the products that I cover so that would be you know, the portfolio managers um, and then the supporting team around them. So the portfolio yeah. analysts that are responsible for the data gathering, uh, yeah. the portfolio specialists, which are basically the kind of subject matter expert on that fund so that the PM yeah. can basically do the job of actually managing <laughs> the money. Um, yeah. And then we work with uh, marketing. I work with um, legal compliance it's it's yeah. actually a really nice function to meet a lot mm. of people in the company and build those relationships yeah. in loads of different areas. You're not you're not kind of, you know, you stick to your pocket and you don't really interact with other parts of the company that a lot of other job functions are like. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. And you mentioned um the sa- the, the the other sales team who are I guess targeting the end client. Yeah. So I guess it's it's almost like a two pronged attack. That's on the institutional and retail side. Yeah. So you have, you know, the oh, sales okay. team that are working on institutional clients. Right. And then you've got the sales yeah. teams that are working on the retail clients. And by that, I mean yeah. the average retail investors like you and me, or that would be yeah. private banks um, or that could be yeah family offices. So that's how you yeah. kind of segment them. I see. I see. And what would the major differences be between the sales team and your team? That's a very good question because, you know, this is the thing that I've always struggled to explain to people in that I'm not doing a sales role, but it kind of is a sales role, right? It's a, it's a business, yeah. de- it's kind of a blend of a business development mm. and relationship manager role because, yeah. you know, obviously I have my products that I need to get out to the market and I need to make sure that they're on these buy lists or preferred providers yeah. lists, but I'm not working on, I have to get X amount of net inflows every year mm. from my yeah. channel. So I don't have yeah. sales targets per se. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the other difference would be that because the type of relationship management I'm doing is very consultative. It can take a much longer time. So, you know, from inception to getting a product buy rated can take like two or two and a half years. Like it can be a very, very long process. Whereas with sales, I guess you kind of, you're expecting a much shorter cycle. You know, sometimes you can get a sale in, in like a month's time, right? Like depending on who you're working with. So that's the, um, I guess that's the main difference of how my role differs to like sales roles. Yeah. It's very much a long-term gain. Um, and, you know, yeah. that's that's been one of the things that when I initially started doing it, I was like, oh my gosh, is this seriously how long this takes? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it taking so long? But then, yeah. you know, you once you've kind of got onto that preferred providers list, it's all worth it because then you're on it yeah like touch wood for a while like you know you, I think you'd have to have something quite drastic like the portfolio manager changing or something mm. like the business imploding and having a disaster or you know having yeah. six years of bad performance or something like that right that, there'd have to be yeah something to really be a catalyst to get you off that list um yeah. Whereas, you know, in an everyday sales sales role, right, like a client can just pull like they could have given you 50 million yesterday, but they can pull 25 of that tomorrow if they want to. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. And uh, and in terms of, you know, once they're once you're on the list, you know, what kinds of things. Mm. 
help you keep you on the list talk to us about what it what it means to I guess manage that relationship <laughs> so this is where you know it's slightly out of my hands on this one I mean I guess obviously the investment fund, like the funds need to deliver <laughs> to what they yeah. said that they're gonna do um yeah and obviously you know we as a firm need to deliver what we've told the client that we were going to do right but I mean things yeah. that I can do which are within my control is I think to you know really be that trusted partner for the consultants so really yeah. be that person where they feel comfortable enough if there's a massive market event going on you know as we've experienced so many of them yeah. um over the last couple of years you know the Ukraine crisis happening right I want them to feel comfortable saying, okay, was there any exposure in your fund? What does this mean for me? Because I need to tell my clients what this means for their money. And so I guess really, I think being that trusted partner is a really, really important part of maintaining that relationship. Um, I think secondly, you know, um, how can you retain it? I think just just be a good relationship manager, right? So send information when you said you're going to send it. Um, yeah. think of them in case there's something that might be of interest that the firm is producing that they might enjoy or might be of benefit to them um, yeah. get to know them as a person you know we're in a people game at the yeah. end of the day so even if it's just taking yeah. someone out for lunch and not talking about work but really mm. getting to know them and what makes them tick yeah. Um, yeah and then again the events that I do like I said so uh, that's all a part of I think the relationship management side of things so um, yeah. you know whether it's investment content, whether it's like professional development content, but really I think yeah. just just providing a bit more of a all-rounded service aside from just a fund, like that's kind yeah. of what I see as a big part of my job. Yeah, it's all the value that's added on top of the fund. Yeah, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, and you know, yeah, and it's you know, it's like there are so many funds. I always say this. I probably shouldn't say this, but I do say this. There are so many funds out there. We're all trying to do the same thing. No one's really, you know, that much better than each other. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's the person that they're really like assessing as well. Yeah. It's not just the fund. And so how can you, how can you demonstrate that, you know, you are someone that they want to work with and you're yeah. really adding value to this relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because at the end of the day, people buy from people, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, yeah. you know, we are, I think anyone who's in a client-facing role, like you are that window dressing insight mm. into a shop. Like you are, you know, yeah. you say if you're walking down a high street and you see a really nice disp- dress on display, like you're going to be far more inclined to do business with that shop. It's no different yeah. to anyone who's in a client-facing role. Like you are that first glimpse into what that entire company represents and so yeah you know you have to provide a I think a meaningful and trusted relationship yeah yeah thank you that's really helpful thank you so much (laughs) okay Ash let's zoom out um what are the things that happen less frequently throughout the year in your role that you'd want to call out so um you know particularly exciting things or or uh particularly challenging things that happen throughout the year yeah so I guess um so as I mentioned you know I am the only one of a global team uh my company's headquarters are in the U.S. so I guess what isn't you know meeting as a global team maybe once a year like we you know we try and do that if we can Mm. if budgets and obviously um travel restrictions allow us to um, that's something I really enjoy because you know it's it can be kind of lonely sometimes doing this job and being the mm. only one doing it for a whole region and so you know when yeah. we get to go to these gatherings you really like share ideas you kind of commiserate together and it just it makes you feel like oh yeah okay there are people who really get my frustrations and my successes on you know that they really really understand them inside out um, so that would be something that doesn't happen that frequently, but I always enjoy it when it does. Um, yeah. And then I guess secondly, you know, when the actual consultants, so when my clients themselves put on events for me to attend. And so, you know, I get to meet uh, other people who are doing similar roles to me in the industry. I really enjoy that again, because kind of like what I said before, it can be quite lonely doing this on your own. Mm-hmm. And it's really nice to talk to your peers about, you know, yeah. experiences that they're having. And I think that's the one thing about um, that I've really valued is that 
you know, I think most people who are in this industry understand that we're all fighting the same battle together. Yeah. And, you know, when we go to some of these conferences together, it's really nice actually just like having a coffee with the person who does the same job at you at a competing yeah. asset manager. And, you know, obviously yeah. you can't you can't talk too much about what you're doing, but it's kind of, again, that community and just leveraging yeah. off, you know, people who very much also can help you and you can help them as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't have to be competition all the time, does it? You know, you, no, you can find no, that community and, and your the, peers. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, that's the way I've always approached this role. And actually, you know, any role that I've done is that you, you can create a community with your competitors and it can be yeah. mutually beneficial, you know, and as long as you're not giving away trade secrets, like obviously use your discretion, yeah. right? But the other reason why I also think it's quite important is this industry is small and, you know, you could yeah. actually be colleagues one day with them. So cultivate that relationship yeah. and, be- befriend your competitors because you never know you might end up you know working together in three four years time yeah absolutely yeah one of my um my, one of my friends has a really nice expression and I and it, it all boats rise so you know it's not like one of you does well and then the others don't we, you know we all rise together and I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it yeah 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 definitely yeah and and Ash, what about extracurricular activities at work? Because I think that you're part of a couple of networks, and I think that's really it's really um, great to be able to share with the audience that you know when we go to work, we don't just do our day job. There is the opportunity to get involved with other things too. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is something I've always always been um, quite passionate about in the. I've always tried to do get involved with extracurricular activities at work because I also just feel you get to meet people that you never really work with. Um, yeah. And, you know, you never know where those relationships could go. Like actually one of my very, very good friends today is someone I met through um, a mentoring scheme that my first ever asset management company was offering. And so, yeah. you know, if I hadn't really pushed myself to do that, I would never would have met her and we never would have had this friendship 10 years later. Uh, yeah. even though I left that company eight years ago so you know I think it's a it's it's a really important thing to do um yeah. what I do is so I try and do things internally but then also externally again in the industry to develop that peer network to mm-hmm. again for my job it really helps me right like having a good peer network so I really understand what's yeah. going on in the market um so at work, I've been pretty involved for the last six or seven years in the diversity and inclusion initiatives that my various companies yeah. have uh, offered. Um, so when I was at Russell Investments, I set up the uh, gender equality network for EMEA, which was really, really good yeah. fun. I learned a lot. Um, I currently co-chair a similar business resource group for Tiro Price in Asia Pacific. Um, And then I've also been involved in some industry organizations, again, around promoting gender equality in the industry, because that's something I personally feel quite passionately about and can relate to. Um, And so I was involved with uh, an organization here called the Financial Women's Association of Singapore. um, And I recently just stepped down from the committee for that. Um, And I've just taken over actually just in January of this year. So there's an organization, uh, a non-for-profit called 100 Women in Finance. And Mm -hmm. so um, I co-chair the Singapore committee now. Um, Again, for me, when I joined, you know, when I moved to Singapore, didn't really know anyone. These industry organizations were just such a nice way for me to just meet Mm -hmm. like-minded people. And I think the the reason why I really feel strongly about 100 Women in Finance is they're trying to really get a lot more women into the industry after university, which is something that I wish had been there 10 years ago when I was in a similar situation. Um, Yeah. And yeah, you know, again, I think the benefits of them are huge, like expanding your network, really learning more about other organizations, um, you know, organizing events outside of work. Like that's been something I've had to do a lot. I've learned an immense amount doing that. And then I think public speaking as well. Uh, It's something that Mm. I used to be quite nervous about um, until the last, you know, until I took on that that role uh, initially six, seven years ago. 
Um, and it's really helped me actually overcome this fear of talking in public, you know, yeah. doing things like this, for example, like I never would have done this seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's benefited me at work, but I actually say getting involved with these extracurriculars has benefited more of my confidence levels more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic, isn't it? And I think it just goes to show how doing these ec- extracurricular activities can help develop skills that many people find scary so networking public yeah. speaking um you know those kinds of things so I think you know if you can find a way to do the things that um you know put you a little bit out of your comfort zone it will pay dividends in the long run yeah thank you definitely and like I said you know you never know who you might meet by doing them mm. I think that's the number one reason I really advocate for them is that you know maybe someone who's super super senior and you'd never get any time with them and if you're yeah. doing like a beach cleanup activity as part of a charity thing that your company's organized and they get to know you through that like that's huge for your career um yeah. so I'd really recommend getting involved for that reason too yeah fantastic thank you so Ash you've mentioned variety and that no two days are the same but what else do you love about your role Oh, gosh. Um, I I mean, look, I love working with people. Um, it's something that I always knew I wanted in a job. Like I always knew I wanted to, you know, client facing, people facing, whatever you want to call it, job. So I love yeah. that aspect. Um, I really love how much like the travel side of it. I'm a huge travel enthusiast. Yeah. It's a huge part of the reason why I took on this role moving from the UK to Asia. Um, And so, yeah, I've been able, you know, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to travel to places like Hong Kong or go to the US because of my job, um, which I've really, really enjoyed. Um, And I love, I honestly love like how many different skill sets it draws upon. Um, I have to, you know, I really have to use my brain because I have to understand the products that I'm, you know, trying to get in front of people. Like I can't just know them yeah on a very you know top level basis like I really need to understand what's going on so I think for me getting my head around you know why has the fund manager invested in this stock or why have they got such a huge allocation to this country like it's really interesting understanding yeah the thesis behind the investment decisions without yeah. having to go into so much detail right um yeah I think it's um you know like I said the event side of it I love like I love organizing events and coming up with content for events so I really really enjoy that aspect and then yeah I guess it's you know I have autonomy which I really love in my job um so I think the huge upside is that you know I I kind of dictate how I'm doing things obviously within reason um and I've just I really love that independence because I am a I am a very independent person and I think I I I know I couldn't do a job which would be very you know these are your parameters this is what you must do and you can't kind of go outside of these parameters so I think for my personality it really really suits me yeah oh thank you very much now it can't all be rosy tell us about the challenges yeah (laughs) Yeah, look, I mean, I think I've touched upon one of them before already, right, when I said it can be a bit lonely sometimes, you know, when, and Mm. I think so many people would be able to relate to this, that when you're the only one doing a role in a region and you're not, you don't have a team on the ground with you, that obviously has its huge advantages, like I just referenced, but then, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I just kind of wish someone was in the office with me that I could talk to in real time, because as I mentioned, my team are in other parts of the world. And so, you know, the time difference yeah. does unfortunately then become a bit of a hindrance at times. Um, yeah. So that's something. Um, and then secondly, you know, as with any kind of influencing role, you know, there is the very real um, prospect of rejection. And so, you know, you've yes. put in hours and hours to try yeah. and get something over the line and it hasn't gone the way you've wanted and so I think, I genuinely think I've become pretty good at dealing with rejection, a lot yeah. of it because of this job, um, you know, because there is so like, it, it's basically just throwing darts and hoping one of them sticks somewhere. And that's kind of continuously the mentality that you have to yeah. adopt. 
And there are some days when it's a bit frustrating, you know, when you have been yeah. plugging away at something for months and months and months, and then you're back to square one. And mm. so, yeah, I think it's it's really been a good lesson in rejection, taking a bit of step back from it and trying to work out, okay, don't be too defeated and kind of how do you move on? Yeah. Thank you. And I think that, you know, rejection, I think, is something that most people struggle with, um, whether at work or in their personal yeah. life. So if you had a, a top tip for, um, I guess, overcoming rejection, what would you what would you share with people? Yeah, I mean, that's that's completely I think, every, you know, you experience it in all walks of life. You experience it probably on a daily basis, you know, in some form of or another. I think. And I read this quote a few, I think it was about a year and a half or two years ago, and it really reframed for me the way I think about rejection now. So it, the quote is, rejection is redirection. And mm. I really love that because actually, you know, it's like, okay, well, you've been rejected, but why? Like, try and work mm. out what is it trying to redirect you to? Um, and what, and actually, maybe this redirection is going to take you way further than this initial you know thing that you were trying to achieve ever could um yeah so yeah I think that would be that would be it for me rejection is redirection yeah yeah that's great and so often it's not personal is it completely and I think that's the again you know now having done consultant relations for the last six and a half seven years like that was something again when I first started out I was like but why like you you take it very personally and you're like yeah why like you know I've I've done nothing but try and deliver more than 100 percent you know why is this not going the way I want it to mm. and I think now maybe I'm a bit older and cynical <laughs> and I'm like okay you know what as long as you kind of know hand on your heart that you could have done everything within your capacity you just have to accept that things some things just don't work out you know and just again yeah. redir it was redirecting you yeah. into something else so yeah when one door closes another opens exactly well hopefully yeah, <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> oh thank you so w when you when you look back at the work you do in consultant relations and um, tell us the thing that you're most proud of um I think I think I'm most proud of well can I, I might pick two if that's okay yeah. um I think the first thing was going you know I when I got into consultant relations I was doing a, I'd been hired into Russell Investments to do something completely different and then the the team structure was reorganized and then suddenly there was you know an opening in the consultant relations team and I had absolutely no experience but, you know, just observing what the work was done, I just, I actually went directly to the hiring manager and said to her, I would like to apply for this job. And, you know, full credit where credit's due, even though I'd never done it before, she also decided to take a bit of a chance on me and took me on. Yeah. And so I think that was the first thing that, and, I, and I've done this, I think, throughout my life that even if I don't have experience for something, I still put myself forward because yeah. I think it's, I really disagree with this thing of you have to have the exact same experience in order to succeed at something. I think if you've got mm. the right attitude and the potential skill set and the personal attributes, I think you, anyone can learn if they want to learn and make a yeah. success of something. So that would be my first first moment and then I think my second moment is definitely a lot more recent where you know I moved out to Singapore a month before the pandemic started this was a brand new job for me an yeah. area uh, you know a region that I'd never ever done this job in I didn't know any of the contacts I didn't really even know any of my colleagues before we went into a working from home situation yeah and it was tough it was really really tough and Singapore yeah. and the region that I cover was extremely um strict in terms of the yeah. COVID measures and so mm. you know I think the thing I'm definitely proudest about is I've still delivered like I look back on the last three and a half years I've still yeah. delivered what I was meant to deliver when every possible limitation was going against me and it's 
honest like in a way it's kind of been the thing that's confirmed to me that I do have I do have what it takes within me even when yeah there are so many factors that are desperately <laughs> trying to not make it a success <laughs> um <laughs> yeah yeah and and I and I can imagine that that almost must give you confidence to do other things because if you can see if if you can succeed in that environment you know I I if that were me I would be thinking wow I can do anything now yeah and I think I mean I yeah well hopefully but you know I think more than anything else what it's taught me is how much of your own cheerleader you really need to be and you know in those moments yeah. when you're really having those doubts I mean don't get me wrong I honestly doubted this decision yeah. this move here about a thousand times in 2020 and 2021 you know I was really yeah. like what was I thinking moving here yeah um not because of the company not because of the job but like I said the, the circumstances yeah. in doing this role was so so difficult for the first two years you know I've only yeah. I only made my first trip to Hong Kong which is half of my market last month uh, two months ago like and wow. I've been doing this job for three wow. and a half years so that that gives wow. you context yeah. into genuinely how many how many um limiting factors there have been right um yeah. but yeah I think it's just it's having that you know just being your own cheer- cheerleader having those pep tops pep, pep talks sorry uh with yourself and yeah I guess just just being a bit compassionate towards yourself mm. in the situation that you're in and I think yeah. we're all we're all pretty harsh on ourselves and actually that's the that's been my biggest learning of the last three and a half years is that I need to just be a bit nicer to myself <laughs> at times and yeah. not as harsh yeah absolutely and I think a couple of things stand out for me there it's you know you know you can only control the controllable and those were events were completely out of your control but what you could control was how you were feeling and you know like you say being your own gene leader and I think that compassion um, point is a really good one and I think there's an author called Christian Neff who does a lot of work around being compassionate to yourself and and it, it, I think it, it is it's scientifically proven to be really helpful um, so people should look that up if they want to find out more thank you yeah I'll have a look too thank you <laughs> Okay, so it doesn't sound like you wanted to do consultant relations when you were a kid growing up. So, <laughs> so tell us, so tell us what you what you were thinking when you were young and what what your career might be. Yeah, so um, I I was in two minds when I was younger. Um, I have, I love reading. Reading is one of my favorite hobbies you know I yeah. I could just get lost in a book for hours on end um and I usually have at least a couple of books on the go um and so I I thought about journalism or something yeah. with words and you know related to reading um yeah. and then the second second career if you want to call it that that I was considering was very influenced by my parents so they both worked in offices and you know they had me when they were fairly young and so just when their careers were taking off obviously I was around and needed to be looked after and so I've spent many many a weekend and evening in one of my parents offices (laughs) and so I think you know having being very exposed to like the office environment from a very very young age um I just thought it looked really glamorous like everyone used to dress up really nicely you know they had these huge stationery cupboards they had these like really cool (laughs) desks and computers um people would would, like go out for lunches and like social events together like I just it just seemed like a very glamorous world to me especially you know when you're like eight nine years ten years old you're very easily very easily influenced and I remember the thing that used to stick out for me was my mum's office literally had the best hot chocolate ever and so I just equated that with like (laughs) this surely must be the best place to work Um, and so yeah I guess um when I got to when I got to really really thinking about it I I mean I knew that I didn't really want to go down the route of you know medicine or law or any of these functions where you kind of study the degree and then that's the yeah. kind of career that you're going down um 
And so I actually did classics at university, which is um, yeah. Latin and ancient Greek uh, languages was something yeah. I was always uh, really interested in growing up. And I partly did that for, I think, the the reading aspect of it, right? Like there's so many mm. books and poems and, you know, stories to read in yeah. classics. The word aspect of it really appealed to me. Um, but also because I genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think, yeah. you know, in hindsight, maybe doing an economics or a business degree probably would have actually helped me out a bit more. But I just, you know, was very much, and my parents were very much of, you're good at Latin, you know, do something that you enjoy yeah. and then work it out yeah. after. And so, yeah, it's it's weird in a way that it's the the avenue to get to where I have, where, you know, the the dream that I had of having good hot chocolate in an office, like that, that's been achieved. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's happened in a quite a kind of roundabout way. Yeah. Oh, and so when you studied classics at uni, were you st- still thinking journalism might be an option at that stage, or had you discounted that? I'd kind of discounted that because I realised I don't like writing on a deadline, and I realised <laughs> how much of a you know huge requirement that is um, of journalism. Yeah. And actually, it was my university degree that really made me realise that because we had to churn out essay after essay and. Mm. you know it was actually one of my classics professors that was saying this is what essentially being a journalist is like right like you're you're given a topic that you need to write about you need to go and do your research on it and you need to churn it out and turn it around very quickly within a word count limit and I realized I really actually don't like limitations around this so journalism I kind of discounted quite quickly after my first year Um, I then actually then thought quite seriously about, you know, the business world. And again, Mm. I just didn't know where to even start because, you know, it's huge. And that's why I love this podcast that you're doing, because I wish there'd been a resource like this when I was at university, because I I just remember being really, really overwhelmed with how many choices there were out there. Now, you know, I was very fortunate that both my parents, like I said, they they've had business careers. They were very helpful in, you know helping me, guiding me, yeah. telling me what they didn't think I was well suited for. Um, and then I actually ended up doing a two-year internship um, at the London Business School when I was, at, so I went to university yeah. in London to King's, yeah. uh, King's College London. And so, you know, being in a city like London, you do have access to a lot of these like unpaid yeah. internships. And I get a bit, I guess a bit more exposure than people who probably mm. don't live in a city don't have. And so I yeah. did this two year internship at the London Business School in their sales and marketing department. And Brilliant. that's when I really realized, OK, yeah, actually, this is cool. Like, you know, I love working with people. I love having a project yeah. that we have to deliver on. Um, and yeah, I think that's what really ultimately influenced me to at least solidify. I definitely want to be in a client facing role. Um, yeah. And then I was also working as a, um, you know, a retail assistant part time at university as well. And again, I just I love yeah. you know, chatting to people when they were like yeah. trying on clothes and like trying to help them out. So, yeah, I guess I guess that's how I kind of realized it's def- it was definitely a client facing or like external facing role that I wanted to be in. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And it sounds like that um, that internship at the London Business School gave you exposure to more business but also gave you exposure to the skill set that you realized that you really enjoyed as well as your your part-time working at uni as well and then I guess that all that almost then gave you yeah almost comfort that you were you know you could then head in the right direction thereafter. Yeah and I think you know again this is why I mean doing an internship I would so recommend it you know because I think people have ideas of what something is and it's it's only when you actually do it do you really understand the ins yeah. and outs of what it requires and I think yeah you know the the UK is such a great place in that sense because you know so many companies hire summer interns or if you're if you're if you have the means to do an unpaid internship I'm mm. sure so many companies would take you on if they legally can um so I'd really really recommend like just dabble in as many internships as you can yeah. because honestly the worst the worst that's going to happen is that you've just increased your knowledge of so many different types of jobs and yeah it's kind of like a okay you've worked out this doesn't work for you this doesn't work yeah. for you but oh you like the aspect of that right so that's maybe something you want to yeah. think about 
honing honing in on when you're actually then looking for your next job yeah yeah there is there is kind of no bad experience because even if you realize things not for you well that's still a win because you now know you don't need to spend the next 20 years going down a path that you've already figured out isn't quite right for you exactly exactly so tell us about the transition from London Business School into the business world yeah so it was again you know as I think with most things in my life a bit of a (laughs) random stroke of random moment that I just turned into a bit of an opportunity um so my parents moved out to Singapore when I was in my second year of university and I'd always loved Singapore um when I'd come to visit and I'd come to visit them after my finals were over I hadn't yet got a job in London because I was you know going to take a few weeks off just to kind of work out what I really really wanted to do yeah I was waiting on London Business School to also see if they had a role that they would give me because I just thought that would make the most amount of sense and I just loved Singapore so much and you know I just remember thinking in that two weeks I think I really want to move here and I just don't know how to make it happen and yeah so I went to a dinner party with my parents and one of uh one of the ladies who was there I got talking to her and she worked for Spencer Stewart, which is a um, global executive search firm. Um, So executive search is basically recruitment, but it's for like the top tier jobs. So like CEOs, CFOs, you know, heads of HR. So like the really, really senior people in companies. And she, and I was talking to her and I was telling her, oh gosh, I'm like thinking I maybe should look for a job in Singapore. And she said, we've literally just gone live today for a graduate analyst. Would you be interested? Yeah. And so, you know, I went in for an interview the next day and then a few more interviews the day after. And I'm not joking, like on my flight back to London, I basically had to, you know, end my lease I had to essentially tell all my friends that I was moving to Singapore in 10 days time (laughs) and it was just such a bonkers moment um and so yeah so I guess that was my first foray into I guess proper business world right so um I'd I'd be pleased to report that we had very good tea and coffee and hot chocolate in the Spencer Street offices (laughs) which is obviously a huge criteria for me um (laughs) back then and yeah It was just it was just such a good first job because, you know, when you're recruiting for loads of different industries, you really see actually like, okay what do these roles and industries really mean? And that was how I got exposed to asset management. So um, I focused on financial services in my second year at Spencer Stewart. And the more searches I did within asset management, the more I just started thinking, actually, this seems like quite a cool industry. And you yeah. don't necessarily have to be in an in an investment role to work here, right? Like you can do yeah. like something like a relationship manager or a salesperson or marketing or, you know, get that kind of people aspect of it that I love. Yeah. But in an industry that I just found really fascinating, to be honest, like I just found it so interesting how many, you know, how does investments work? Like how many different yeah. roles there are? And so that that started my very long, um, I think, attempt to get into asset management. Yeah. Um, so I then decided, OK, you know what, I want to apply for a proper graduate scheme. I really want to do this properly because yeah. I've not got a economics or business background. And so yeah. I really want to be trained properly. And, you know, 11, 12 years ago when I was doing this, Joe, they did not take you know, classics graduates into asset management roles. I I remember. And so I, yeah. And so I applied for something like 80, 82, 84, something like that graduate schemes. And I was invited to interview for about eight or nine of them. And then I got two offers. And so my life for a period of six months was, I'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning. I'd spend an hour and a half on an application and then I'd get yeah. up and go to work and I'd work for like 12, 13 hours and then I'd come back home. Yeah. And that was literally it. But, you know, and it was grueling. Like it was a really yeah. grueling five to six months. And there were so many moments when I was like, I'm never going to make it. This was such a stupid idea. Like, but, yeah. you know, I think it's it's that self-belief that I think I've had. And again, that kind of came out during the last couple of years in COVID as well of just keep trying, just keep persevering yeah. and something will happen. Like it's, yeah. it's a numbers game at the end of the day, just keep going and something will materialize. Yeah. 
And so that's how essentially I got into asset management. Um, so I was accepted onto Schroeder's graduate scheme in 2013. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. relocated back from Singapore to London for that. Um, yeah. And then I spent seven years working at Schroeder's Russell Investments and then now T Rivers. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing. So just to, so I can get the order right in my head, was it was the was London Business School before Spencer Stewart or after? Yeah, yeah. So, so so London Business School was when I was at university in my second and third year. Um, so that was oh, 2009 okay. yeah. and 2010. So like yeah. the summers. And then Spencer Stewart was, uh, no, no, no. So I actually used to do one full day a week um, oh, at London Business School yeah. Um, yeah. throughout my second and third year at university. And then yeah. Spencer Stewart was my first ever proper job uh, when yeah. I graduated in Singapore. And yeah. that was for two years. Uh, and then I moved back to join Schroeder's uh, when I was 22 uh, in 2011. Yeah. Sorry, in 2013, okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Just a couple of things I want to pick up there on there. Firstly, I'm really pleased to say that employers, I, 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 know, I know for sure in asset management, but I expect more generally in financial services too, are more inclusive when it comes to graduate degree now. Um, I think that um, mm. it used to be very restrictive, you know, only economics, only finance, only, you know, maybe engineering. But, you know, it was very narrow, yeah. um, you know, the subjects that yeah. they would consider for internships, graduate schemes and so on. So it is much broader now, I'm pleased to say. But I also just wanted to pick up on, you know, you, you sent those 80 or so applications out how did you keep going because that must have been a really tough time when you were you know keeping plugging away and not feeling and getting the traction yeah I mean it look it was tough and I think the thing that really didn't help was a lot of people were telling me at the time how are you going to go from recruitment to an asset management graduate scheme like and you haven't yeah. even got the degree right like it would yeah. be different if I had the economics degree I'd done recruitment for two years and yeah. then I decided to make the shift so yeah I'm not I'm not gonna lie there were a lot of people I think who doubted uh, whether I could do it that was a huge um yeah huge motivator yeah and you know I'd, I'd set myself a time limit you know I think you have to mm. be a little bit pragmatic about these things as well yeah so I would kind of said to myself okay, I'm going to try for this one year. So I started off in, I think it was July or August. And then I kind of said, okay, I'll keep going for one whole year and then I'll stop. Yeah. Because if it hasn't worked yeah. out, then, you know, I need to reassess and work out, is this actually yeah. feasible or do, do I want to consider something else? Yeah. Something that I did, and <laughs> this is just me and, a lot of my friends make fun of me for how much I love spreadsheets, but I love spreadsheets. Um, I made a little spreadsheet because, you know, I think on the moments that I was feeling a bit deflated, it was really nice to look back and just see, you know, OK, mm. when I started off, I wasn't even being called for the initial 30 minute telephone interview. Then about, you know, yeah. six, seven applications in, that started happening, right? And so it's yeah. that spreadsheet was just a way of just really tracking the incremental gains. And that would give me yeah. a bit of the boost that I needed to then keep going. Um, yeah. I still have that spreadsheet. I've always, I've never deleted it because for me, it's just a reminder of that six month period and just yeah. what progress was made from, you know, start to finish. Yeah. 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 And I yeah, guess yeah. you could probably go back to that spreadsheet now and see that, you know, that trend of getting more traction with each employer. And and it and it was possibly because you were learning along the way too, you know, what to put in your application and Definitely. then at the interview, you know, how to perform an interview and and those kinds of things. So, yeah, what a lovely record to have of that time. Yeah, and I think what I used to what I used to do, and again, this I think I do really think like this is what helped me improve was after every application, you know, anything that translated into an interview, immediately after the interview, I'd go back to that spreadsheet and write down, oh, I think I answered this well. Oh, they answered, they asked this question that 
I don't think I answered very well or that I could have been better prepared for. And so then I used to reference the spreadsheet before any interview. And yeah. that's how I, I think I really just was constantly just increasing my chances of making it to the next round because it was very yeah. real time feedback yeah. that I was, you know, recording. Um, yeah. Because the thing is, and I've realized this over the years, is that if you leave it even a day or two, you don't remember everything. Like we forget yeah. stuff. And actually, whereas if you're doing it right after the fact, you will literally yeah. remember everything. You remember how you feel, you know, and that it's actually this those small things that I think can make a huge difference in terms of your progress and then ultimately whether you end up succeeding or not yeah yeah well I think a great example of resilience and tenacity and yeah and not believe in the haters as Taylor Swift would say right (laughs) I love that you've done a Taylor Swift reference she's my favorite (laughs) who doesn't love Taylor (laughs) <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think kudos to you because I think many would have given up after 10 applications. Um but you know, somewhat similar to sales and consultant relations, it's a numbers game, isn't it? The more you do, you know, the more likely you are to get a yes and you've got that yes in the end from Schroders who I, you know, good for them. Yeah, and I think, you know, give Schroders where credit was credit credit where credit was due. You know, they <clears throat> I mean, I used to remember the HR lady was like, We've never hired a classics person before. Like she was <laughs> drumming it into my head. <laughs> I was like, Okay, I get this, you know. Um but yeah, no, I really I, I believe that honestly everything in life is just a numbers game. Like I think, you know, it's yeah. it's the analogy of the dartboard. If you're only throwing one dart, you're not mm. you're not increasing your probability of hitting bullseye but if you're throwing 20 yeah you're increasing your probability of hitting bullseye right like I think any everything in life is honestly the more you put out there yeah it will come back and find you when it's meant to find you but you have the responsibility of putting out there as much as you physically can and that you're capable of yeah 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 well thank you very much so tell us um tell us a little bit about the 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 scheme at Schroders what what department did you work in or departments yes I was at the I was on the distribution um side so you know for anyone who doesn't know so in asset management you have distribution and investments are kind of and then I guess back office if you want to call on that or like shared services are kind of the three overarching pillars distribution is essentially you know sales marketing client service product sometimes um, and so I was on the UK client services team. Um, and so, you know, what that involved was, you know, getting getting involved with, I guess, sales management tools, um, you know, so like how much of Schroeder's UK book of business was at risk from clients of clients withdrawing money, right? So doing like loads of analysis yeah. on that, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then, you know, say if a client like says, I want to redeem 2 million today, then liaising with the like operational team internally because we had to do we had faxes back then which I was (laughs) shocked with because I had no idea how to use a fax machine um and so you know being kind of the point of contact between the client and then making sure that the right people internally then kick off that process of withdrawing that money or adding to the account if they need to um and then you know coming up with helping kind of produce the quarterly reports that we used to send to clients. So that basically shows them, you know, how has their investment done in the last quarter? How has it done in the last year, three years, five years? Mm -hmm. Working with the, you know, investment comms team to get a write-up of, okay, this is what exactly has been going on in your fund. Um, And so, yeah, it was, I think it was a good grounding. I knew pretty early on though that that wasn't for me. I think I found Mm -hmm. it. It, I didn't find it intellectually challenging enough, if I'm being honest. Um, and I kind yeah. of knew then that, like, you know, that there was a function that was better suited for me. Um, yeah. And that's why I that's why I feel like it's kind of done a nice circle of, you know, I think consultant relations, like I said earlier, is is that really nice blend of mm. using my brain, using my yeah. people skills, and using my 
organization and coordination skills right like I think it really just yeah. it's a re it encompasses all of that really well yeah yeah nice so then after Schroeder's you moved to Russell and what did you start off doing at Russell um well I remember you were the one who uh were there you you were, you were the one who <laughs> helped me sign my letter at Russell <laughs> Um, yeah, no, so I joined the UK institutional team on the sales team, uh, initially in yeah. an analyst role. Um, and then, like I said, you know, Russell went through a huge reorganization about six or seven months after I joined. And then this headcount came up in the consultant relations team. And so I moved pretty quickly after I joined Russell, um, six, seven months in from the sales team to the consultant relations team. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest is history. And then the rest of history, yeah. And then, you know, I was at Russell for four and a half years. Um, yeah. And then my whole switch to Tiro and moving to Singapore was just one very random day where I went yeah. in to meet my now boss, um, just as a kind of a, you know, general kind of catch up. Like there wasn't really a role in the UK that was live or anything. Uh, yeah. And then halfway through our conversation, you know, he said, actually we've got a lot we've got a role that we've been trying to fill in Asia would you would you be interested in moving back to yeah. Asia and doing this for us and <laughs> you know it just it came at a time in my life where I think I re I was really ready for a bit of a change if I'm being honest like yeah. I I'd kind of got to a point where I was getting like I said itchy feet you know I'd been doing the role at Russell for well over four years at that point and I loved it I mean I loved my boss I loved you know the people I worked with but I think you know when it's time to go and it's time to try something new. And I just, honestly, it was just fate that like this hero role came up to me. And I, I always knew when I left Singapore in 2013 that I wanted to move back here. And I knew that I wanted to eventually kind of be in Asia long-term. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it was it was just fate. Honestly, it really was fate. But, this, uh, but it, I think it was fate. But then I think I also put the thought out there quite a few times of, I want to move back to Asia, but yeah. I don't need it for the right role. And so I feel it kind yeah. of like just materialized when it was meant to happen. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, it's it really does feel like a full circle thing, doesn't it? I'd really love to go um, a bit deeper into, so when you were at Russell and you're now in the consultant relations team and you're realizing, yes, this is where I'm meant to be. What What was, you know, what were the signs that you'd kind of found your, you know, your your place as it were in 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 terms of a role look I think you've got to <clears throat> I think you've got to look at how much are you you know how excited are you about going to work and yeah have you how much have you learned at the end of the day and like that's how I always assess any job that I'm doing is that if I'm dreading it every single morning that's a huge sign for me that something needs to change. If I'm yeah. bored at the end of the day, I either need to address it at the company first and see if there's ways to solve it. Or yeah. like I said, you know, maybe there's, you come to a realization that you've done everything you can to try and yeah. challenge yourself more. But you know, there are other factors that maybe then mean that you can't go any further. Right. And so then maybe yeah. it's time to think about moving on elsewhere and so for me, it was really that thing of, you know, it was a brand new team. There was so much potential for growth for us. No two days were the yeah. same. Um, I loved how much, like, I think responsibility and, um, you know, autonomy I was being given to kind of foster my own yeah. relationships and start doing mm -hmm. things in a, with the guidance of my boss, but start doing things in a way that I felt were very authentic to me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, like I said, I, I had, I think for the first three, three and a half years, I never was bored at the end of the day. And then yeah. it was really like, okay, yeah, I think I've kind of reached the ceiling of this now. I'm kind of ready for yeah. something a bit meatier and that's going to challenge me in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are a couple of good things to look out for, aren't they? Are you, are you enjoying it? Are you learning? And if you are have if you if you've got both of those things are a tick, then that's a good sign that you're in the right place. And if if it, yeah, if it does become to the point where you're either dreading it or not feeling challenged or not fulfill, feeling fulfilled, and there's nothing that can be done internally to 
either expand your mm. role or you know give you an opportunity in another department then it might be time to to think about the next move yeah and I think I completely agree and I think there's one other factor that maybe sounds a bit crass saying it but you know it is ultimately a huge uh something that should be of a huge consideration you know we're working so that we can fund the lifestyle that we want right and you know yeah. I think I knew that okay this like outside of work these are the things that make me happy now I'm working so that I can then afford the kind of lifestyle that I've been yeah. dreaming about for a very very long time so something like the traveling was really really important to me or yeah. you know going out uh, I'm a massive foodie like I love cooking I love trying new restaurants and like you know yeah. so being able to afford that like I think that is a factor that I I don't think enough people put an emphasis on. Mm. And I think especially now with the cost of living crisis, with, you know, just general living standards, it's ex- it's yeah. getting more expensive. Like you have to think about the financial aspect of a job. And I'm not saying yeah. sell your soul because, you know, you want to afford a luxury vacation twice a year. Yeah. But I think just give give a bit more importance to, OK, yeah, I really, really love this. But does this now mean that I'm not going to be able to afford a house for the next 50 years because it's something that I love? Right. Yeah. So I think my my advice to people has always been, I think if you can enjoy 70 percent of your job and it gives mm. you the lifestyle that you want, find that joy that that 30 percent isn't giving you outside of work. Yeah. So, you know, if it's yeah. like through hobbies, if it's like if you want to set up something on the side in your own time, that's a true passion of yours. If it's yeah. volunteering, if it's there's so many like so many different ways that you can find that passion and for me you know volunteering was a huge aspect of it so I've regularly volunteered um throughout my career because I think you know it it is something that genuinely does bring me a lot of joy but I'm also pragmatic enough to realize that I never could have paid off my student loan or you know like attempted to buy a house if if I made that yeah a full-time thing when I was in my 20s I think it's a very different thing when you kind of feel finance if you can afford it but yeah yeah maybe I'm going down a bit of a different tangent here but yeah I think I think the the financial aspect of it is something that I think a lot more people need to think about yeah I think it's a, a really great point and and I think that you know when you think about your future you know I think you're right you you know, you try not to just think about what job it would be or what company or what industry. Try and also think about, well, what would my whole life look like? What would, where would I like to be working? You know, who would I like to be working with? You know, what amount of free time would I like to have? And like you say, and w- exactly. what, what do I want to be doing? And what do those things cost? Therefore, what do I need to be aiming for financially? So it's a little bit like, setting that return goal you mentioned earlier isn't it it's you know setting a goal of what you need to achieve to pay for the lifestyle you want but you know you design that lifestyle you want yeah and I I I completely agree you know I think it's 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 so within your means and I think the earlier you start thinking about this stuff I think I think that's the thing I'm kind of trying to get across is that I think a lot of people who are probably listening to this podcast you know that we're so so much focus is given on do something that you enjoy and I'm not for a second saying don't do that but just have yeah. some ounce of pragmatism in there and just think take yeah. a step back and think about okay but financially is this gonna be able is this gonna cause me anxiety or is this gonna give me yeah. you know just general happiness on a day-to-day basis yeah yeah no those are really great points and and I think that they are really important for people to start thinking about earlier because you know the the sooner you start thinking about um things like that the you know the the longer you have to make them happen yeah, yeah. completely completely and you know okay. and on the flip side right like what's the point of you know you see some of these like top graduate jobs which are paying extortionate amounts of money but then yeah does the person have a life? No. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. again, you've, you've got to work out what that, what's the, where on that spectrum do you want to sit? And only you yeah. can work that out individually. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And I think it's worth remembering, isn't it? Like you say, we work to live. We don't live to work. Mm. And, and 
and you can drive passion and purpose from other activities, like you say, um, uh, volunteering being one example of that. Yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you. OK, so so um, I guess I'd love to ask you um, what's and I know you've only really been back in, you know, active Singapore life for, you know, a, a short amount of time now because of the pandemic. But what, what would you say are the main differences between working in the UK and working in Singapore that people might like to know about who might be thinking that that might be a nice transition for them? Yeah, so I think um, it's, a, it's a good question. And it's something that you know, it, I think the pandemics, to be honest, changed a lot of it. So I think the first thing is people, there's a lot of FaceTime in Singapore, luckily not at my organisation, but I yeah. think, you know, the whole thing of you must, like, you need to be seen to be working X amount right. of hours. Whereas in the UK, you know, people kind of like, are aghast at you if you try and schedule a meeting for like 3 p.m onwards on a Friday <laughs> they're like what <laughs> and so um yeah I think the, the I think the emphasis on yeah FaceTime mm. putting in the hours it's very it's more pronounced here than it is in the UK like I kind of feel in the UK as long as you're doing your work you know obviously yeah. it depends on different jobs right but it's I don't think it's as rigid in the UK as it is here yeah um and I think the main, the, the one thing that I find, uh, you know, it's, it, I knew it before I took on the job anyway, but, you know, I have to do night calls um, because mm. of the time zone that I'm in. Yeah. I think you have to think about, can your lifestyle give you the space to do that? So, you know, if you have young yeah. kids, maybe you don't want to be jumping on a night call from, you know, 8 p.m. Mm. to 10 p.m. with the U.S., right? Yeah. Again, this depends yeah. on what type of organization you work for as well. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, um, yeah, I think the night call thing definitely is a thing. Um, I think it's also Asia, like, and, you know, I mentioned this before, Asia is still in a very different part of their growth phase versus mm -hmm. the UK. So there is a lot more of, OK, well, you know, we're just going to have to take a risk and see what happens because it hasn't been done here before. And so we've got no way of yeah. finding it out unless we try it. Whereas I think yeah. in the UK, just given where the industry and a lot of roles are, there's always mm. been um, a, you know, uh, an example or something that you can kind of draw upon to help you navigate something. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say it's definitely here. It's a bit more proactive. UK is a bit more reactive. Like I said, the time zone thing is definitely something you need to think about. Um, and then, yeah, I think the FaceTime thing is something that I, I find quite difficult sometimes here. But like I said, luckily, I don't mm. I'm not exposed to that in my job. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think the last thing and this is a huge benefit that I love is just how multicultural Singapore is. Mm. So, you know, you've got people from all over the world living here and not that you don't in London. But I think because Singapore is smaller as a country, you know, it's only got five, five million people you notice yeah. it so much more versus the UK or other parts yeah. of the world. Um, and truly, you know, I've, I've met people from literally all over the world and been exposed to their, their cultures and their backgrounds. And yeah, that's been just such a unexpected bonus of working here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right, Ash. So when you look back at your career journey so far, um, what's been the biggest high? biggest high oh gosh um I think again can I pick three I know that sounds a bit greedy but of course <laughs> <laughs> the more um, the so I'd say, I'd say <laughs> so I'd say definitely the first one would be getting into the industry when like I said I had so many doubters um that yeah. honestly to like to date has been one of the proudest moments of my life um getting that you know acceptance letter and just seeing how much hard work was put in and what that translated into was just huge. So that would definitely be number one. Um, number two was, uh, again, a bit of a massive pinch me moment. Um, so in 2018, um, so I don't know if you know this, but the Financial Times produces a list of 50 female future leaders um, every year. 
And in 2018, they very kindly put me as number seventh on that list. Um, and I was also the youngest on the list at that time as well. And it was Amazing. really like a huge pinch me moment when, you know, I got to yeah. go to the ceremony at the Landmark Hotel in London and like go and get my award. And I think also just going to the, you know, going to Sainsbury's, picking up the Financial Times and seeing my name in print amongst like yeah. all these other hugely successful people. Um, you know, that was that I never in my wildest dreams expected to have that at the age of 27. So that was amazing. Just, yeah, just a massive pinch me, mo- massive pinch me moment. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the final thing I'm really proud of is actually how I've navigated the last few years. Um, like I said, yeah. you know, it's been really, really trying. Um, and I even, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? But and how long I stay in consultant relations, but like I'm just, I'm really proud of how I've delivered when yeah. circumstances were really, really against me over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Those are really great. And I was going to ask you about challenges you've overcome on the career journey so far, but I think we've, um, I think we've kind of covered those, haven't we? Because it sounds as though yeah. the highs and yeah. the proudest moments are overcoming those challenges. And I think that's fantastic. I definitely struggled. I'm not going to lie. Like my first couple of years in the industry, I struggled. Like it was very apparent to me that I was at a huge disadvantage compared to my peers having not yeah. you know got the basics or the foundations that they already mm-hmm. had um yeah and yeah I think that's you know again the rejection is redirection like you've just got to keep remembering that and so that was tough yeah. but um I've definitely come out a much stronger person because of it and you know I wouldn't yeah. change it for the world like I think these these challenges that you overcome really shape you as individuals um and you wouldn't mm-hmm. be who you are if it wasn't for them as cheesy as it sounds so yeah yeah, no, I think that, um, I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to quote another pop star here, but, you know, the Kelly Clarkson song does feel quite appropriate. <laughs> well, it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger here. So. I knew, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Such a good song. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I really want to ask you, um, if somebody is going into financial services and they are coming in with a non-finance um, qualification, what would your top tip be for them to kind of try and get up to speed with with some of those basics that you felt that your peers had? Yeah, I mean, I think in hindsight now, you know, I wish I'd spent some time just reading through like the basics of you know investing, so bonds, you know, yeah. equities. How does that actually work in theory? You know, the basic economic kind of concepts. Um, yeah, brushing up on my math skills. Um, you know, I think there's, I think there's a lot you can do. Also, talking to people, and I think people mm. don't do this enough. And I don't, you know, I really don't understand why. Actually, um, I, I mean, if someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and said hi, you know, I'm joining X organization. I really don't understand anything about this, but I feel like you might be able to help me. I would 10 10 times out of 10 make time to help that person out. And I'm pretty sure most people would. And Mm. so I get that it's like a really daunting aspect of reaching out to someone that you don't know and asking them for a chat. But, you know, I think the thing you need to remember is that we've all been there at some point. We've all started our careers somewhere. And we all yeah. remember that feeling of, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I wish I could talk to someone and I wish someone would help me out. And so I would just say, just, you know, prepare well, but reach out. To, like, don't waste someone's time. You know, I had I had this yeah. happen recently where, you know, someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and I gave up an hour of my time for her. Um, she hadn't done any research on mm. she was asking about consultant relations as a function no research had no questions and you know 10 minutes in I was just like this was such a waste of time for me because this girl's yeah. clearly not prepared so I would say if you're yeah. going to do it please just to respect the other person's time um and yeah. you know make sure you prepare really well for it and you know what you want to get out of this session like as long as you yeah. know that then you can also guide the conversation in the way that you need it to go to but just have have the confidence to reach out to people because like I said you really would be surprised how many people are very willing to make some time 
for a young person yeah. who wants to know more yeah yeah thank you that's great um you've already mentioned ash that you've gained a friend out of one of your mentors and i'm just really curious yeah. about the role that role models and mentors and sponsors have had on your career so far yeah so i'd say um role models um i look at i look at it in three ways if i'm being honest so i look at them internally ex and uh, internally in the in, in my company externally in the industry and then in my personal life right yeah. um and so I'd say four more mentoring schemes at work you know I've been incredibly fortunate to be given access to those and again I think these mentoring schemes are what you make of them like if you mm -hmm. go into them not wanting to give them the time that they deserve or not thinking through what your objectives are in terms of what you're trying to gain then that's going to be mirrored in the experience that you have. But if you take the time to really, you know, talk through with your mentor or sponsor what it is you're trying to achieve, then they can also help you to the best of their capacity as well and make it mutually yeah. beneficial. Um, I think industry mentors are really, really important because I think they give you that perspective because sometimes when you're going through something and, you know, you're asking someone in the organisation, it can just feel quite claustrophobic. And so sometimes yeah. when I've reached out to people in the industry who, you know, I've considered in a mentoring role, even if they're not formally my mentor, I've yeah. just asked them for a coffee and just being like, look, I just kind of want to run something by you, get your perspectives on it. It's really important to have that view, I think, because it just helps you take a bit of a step back and realize, yeah, number one, OK, maybe I'm overreacting. Let's just take a bit of a step back and look at it from an outsider's perspective. And yeah. secondly, you really do realize that we're all going through the same thing. You know, they've probably been through it. Like everyone's <laughs> going through the same thing. And it just makes you, again, I think, just feel slightly less overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I've always had mentors. Like I said, I'm, I've had mentors in my company, in the industry. I've also now been a mentor for quite a few people yeah. in my company, in the industry. I really like I will continue to do this for as long as I can and continue to have mentors yeah. for as long as I can because like I said it's just I, I've learned so much which has been such invaluable advice um, yeah. and then I think the third the third point I wanted to touch on I guess role models from personal life um, you know and I sound, sounds pretty cheesy but my parents I think have been uh, yeah. huge um, huge role models for me they're very different people but you know, the way they've navigated certain, certain situations. And every time I've asked them for advice, you know, they always give me very um, meaningful and very tailored advice. And mm. yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm very proud of them as parents, but also what they've achieved. And so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, I feel, I feel very fortunate that I've had that aspect yeah. of it as well. But, you know, it, do, it doesn't necessarily have to be parents, right? It could be an aunt yeah. or an uncle or a sibling or, a yeah. friend's parent or whatever like I think again going back to my point that I was making earlier you'd be surprised how many people want to help but you just have to mm. ask like people yeah. can't read your brains right but you have yes. to put yourself out there and ask for it yeah yeah I think that you know we're, we're, we're quite often we're quite bad at asking for help but actually I think you know we'd be surprised how many people are willing to help and uh, and like you say, just make sure when someone says, yes, I'll help you, that you, um, you know, you're prepared, you have an agenda for the conversation and you go there to make the best use of that time. And then both of you walk away feeling like that, that that's been a, you know, a, a positive experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I just two more things I'd add on to that, you know, it's it sounds really simple, but send them a thank you note after, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's such an overlooked thing, but it takes two minutes to do it. Just do it. Yeah. And I think yeah. the other thing I think people should do more of is, you know, when you have taken help from someone, don't just treat it as a transactional relationship, you know, keep them posted on how you're getting on. Like, yeah. even if it's just once a year, just shoot them a little email and say, I'm, you know, I just wanted to keep you updated on my progress even if it's something yeah. completely different like people won't people won't forget that and it's mm. again it's it's shifting that mindset from this person needs to help me in the here and now to cultivating a relationship with this person yeah. who has shown me some kindness at one point in my life and so yeah. I think it's you know I ought to keep them posted 
on how yeah their input has helped me get to where I am today yeah yeah that's I think that's really great advice thank you for sharing so for those um for those who are listening or watching who think they might like to you know get into consultant relations are there any essential or helpful educations trailings or qualifications that someone should be thinking about oh gosh that's a hard one joe given that i just kind of fell into it <laughs> don't really know. um look i mean i think obviously you know having having an understanding of what the role involves and i get that like from the outset that's really tough so again you know going back to my point of talk to people who are doing it right now mm -hmm. or talk to people who know what that role involves so that you're really building up that ground understanding um yeah. I mean I would say you know any any kind of financial qualification is always never gonna hinder you because I think it's yeah. only just gonna increase your investment knowledge um and that that won't be just beneficial for this role but think about future roles as well where mm. that could also help you out um and then I think you know again it's it's a lot of, like it's a lot of dealing with other people so maybe presentation skills or maybe yeah. you know negotiation skills or something something like that which yeah. is slightly softer but I think you know the sooner you master them the, the better you're going to do yeah. this role um yeah yeah they're, they're probably three, th three things I can think of off the top of my head yeah thank you and would something like the IMC or the CFA be helpful in this role yeah definitely so I think um IMC definitely, definitely would be important um, because it's yeah. a really good base level qualification uh, in the UK. Yeah. CFA, I don't know. I'm, I'm personally not as convinced. I think, uh, I think, yeah. obviously, it's a great qualification and it improves yeah. your investment education a lot. Does it yeah. directly have a return on investment for the amount of hours that you have to put into it for this particular job? No. Yeah. You don't need it. Yeah. And. Yeah what your 300 or 400 hours that you're spending on each level of CFA is much better utilized in improving your external network or getting yeah. to understand your products more or you know helping to bring brand build your company's name like that yeah. is going to help you succeed in this this particular job a lot yeah. more yeah all right that's great thank you Ash, I'd really like to talk about non-technical or soft skills. You know, what would you call out as the essentials for somebody considering a career in consultant relations? Um, gosh, OK, I think. Um, I mean, professionalism is something that has to be said without a doubt. You know, like, as I said yeah. before, you are you are that first window glimpse into a company for a lot of people and so the way yeah. you conduct yourself and with professionalism I really mean you know quite a few things of punctuality um prepping sending things and following up on queries when you're supposed to be and not being tardy about that um yeah. you know even when you're in a meeting ensuring that everyone in the room is introduced adequately and that you know all the meeting preps are done properly um yeah you know just yeah just just prefer so I think professionalism which is quite a wide umbrella I think that would be a big one yeah um like I said I think the ability to like I think if you're an introverted person who finds talking to new people daunting this job mm. would be hard because there's a lot of yeah. you know meeting new people trying to cultivate relationships with people that you don't know and yeah. it comes easy, easily for some people. It doesn't come easily for some people. And if yeah. it doesn't come easily for you, I'd say you're going to find this difficult. Um, yeah. I think being quite, you know, a bit of a doer, like it's, you have to have a can do attitude because as I said, you get rejected so often that mm. you, if you can't yeah. sit there wallowing, like you've got to just learn from it, get up and move on yeah. and just have a can do yeah. attitude. And then finally, you know, I think it's managing stakeholders, which is really, really important. So it's managing stakeholders internally because you've got all the internal teams that, you know, you're trying to have that good relationship with. It's your counterparts in different locations that you're all working on the same global accounts. So you've got to make sure that you're all 
working in harmony together and communicating yeah. and collaborating. Um, and then, you know, managing stakeholders at your clients, right? So making mm-hmm. sure that that relation, like you are managing that relationship and their expectations and the delivery of what you said you're going to do in a way that you're meant to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ash, what does the future hold for this profession? Um, gosh, I really don't know, if I'm being honest. I think, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Look, I think, will it still be around in five years' time? Yes, I think so. You know, as we've kind of, as I've kind of alluded to, there is a very pivotal role that consultant relations play in, you know, yeah. helping a firm win new business and then retain that yeah. new business. But, you know, I think my my question is with technology, how much, you know, growing at the rate that it is. Mm. And I and I question this, by the way, for all relationship management functions. Right. Yeah. Like right now, you need a relationship manager because technology has not got to that point where it can fully replicate what a human being can do for you in a client yeah. service capacity in 10, 15 years time. I really don't know. I mean, mm. the way tech is going yeah. right now, who knows? Right um and so yeah I think it's that's why you know it's really important to I think be cognizant of that but then also not be too overwhelmed by it and realize that you are adding a lot of value so um yeah I'd say I think I'd say in the short to midterm it's still going to be around after that I don't (laughs) really don't know (laughs) yeah it's um a really yeah it's a really strange time isn't it but I think that you know we've obviously been through lots of evolutions of you know change in the workplace before and you know we're all still here working and hopefully it just means that the the kind of the routine or the boring things the bit gets the bits that get replaced by technology or uh ai or you know it's it's uh yeah it's uh not going to be the the human touch which hopefully is ir- irreplaceable <laughs> yeah i mean i do i look i i think I think at least, you know, for someone who's at university right now, who's perhaps considering this, yes, I would still say, I think you'd still get at least a 10 to 15 year decent career out of it. Um, I think the one thing I would emphasize, though, is don't think so much about the job title, but think about the skill set. And I think the skill set that you're gaining in doing consultant relations makes you actually very attractive for a lot of other jobs. And so... Yes, would do I think that the consultant relations job as I'm doing it today will exist in 15 years? I don't know. But is the skill set that I've gained doing this job going to yeah. make me attractive for an employer in 15 years? Yes, I do think so, because it's so varied. Yeah. And yeah, that, I mean, that's 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 the way I'd think about it. Hopefully yeah. I'm not unemployed in 15 years time. <laughs> I can't imagine that would be the case. <laughs> um, Ash, I'd also really just like to get your views on how things have improved from a diversity and inclusion perspective in financial services. You've been you've been in for over a decade now. What changes have you seen? Yeah, I mean, look, it's like I said, it's something that I I feel personally quite strongly about because when I joined the industry 10 years ago, I was actually appalled by how bad it was. I really thought in the year 2013 that, you know, there'd be a lot more equal gender representation, that there'd be more business resource groups for like, you know, disability or, you know, LGBTQ plus or veterans. I think there's so much that has changed in the last 10 years and I really welcome the change. However, I still think we've got an incredibly long way to go. Um, yeah. And, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. And so I think every one thing I always kind of try and think about is everyone's constantly focusing on what isn't happening. But let's just focus on what is happening and how much change yeah. there has been in the last 10 years. And you, I mean, you've alluded to one of the points earlier of, you know, graduate schemes now taking on um, people with non-economic backgrounds like that for me yeah. is huge progress in the last 10 years. Yeah um you know having having targets for the amount of female board directors on public boards that's huge progress right having more female portfolio managers who are you know having women in I guess the more traditionally male roles in the last 10 years even if it's been an incremental increase that's still huge progress 
you know, having having massive corporations, having a disability led business resource group that definitely yeah. wasn't around 10 years ago. So I yeah. think it's really important to celebrate these small wins and not see them as small because incrementally mm-hmm. they're all contributing to a huge change. And, you know, I yeah. think we were all very quick to criticize what could be better. And I think we just need to get a bit better about complementing the smaller signs of progress that are actually happening. Yeah. 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 Great advice. Thank you so much. Okay. So for people who want to find out a little bit more, as well as uh, re-listening to this podcast or reaching out to people, <laughs> where where might you point people who want to find out more about this uh, career profession? Um, well, firstly, you know, add me on LinkedIn, drop me a message. You know, I, uh, I, <laughs> I meant what I said earlier, where I really don't mind giving up my time for someone who really wants to find out more, uh, is well prepared for it. And, you know, again, putting you, if I'm not the right person, putting you in touch with someone who I think could be relevant, right? So just yeah. please reach out on LinkedIn um, and just, you know, bite the bullet. If it's not to me, if it's for someone who you've been hesitating about reaching out to, just do it. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? They ignore you. Yeah. That's fine. It's okay. We'll all move on. <laughs> <Yeah>. right? um, <laughs> yeah. I think secondly, and I think people don't really do this enough, but is actually talking to recruiters a bit more. Um, mm. So obviously recruiters have a really good holistic understanding of the industry that they specialize in and the various roles that build up that industry. And, you know, I think if you can cultivate a good relationship with a recruiter, then go for it. Yeah. And Ash, if you get overwhelmed with questions and uh, messages and so on, we could always do a follow up Q&A or something. That might be nice. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Very happy to. (laughs) Okay, Ash, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were just starting out in your career? Um, There'll be bumps along the way, but perseverance and self-belief always pays off. I genuinely believe that. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And what's your secret to happiness and fulfillment at work? You know what? It's it's taken a long time for me to get here, but I think it's really looking at life as a bit of a pie chart, which I know that sounds weird, but you know, in any pie chart, if you put too much emphasis on one segment, it's going to make the overall picture distorted, right? And so life, I think, is the same. Like, you've got to... There are going to be days when work takes over and then there have to be days when personal life has to, you know, have all your health or your hobbies or just any... Yeah, anything. Your holidays, like, they have to take priority. Yeah. And so I think it's really taking a bit of a step back and knowing what segment of your pie chart needs more attention that day and not feeling guilty about then when you have to adjust on other days yeah yeah that's a great way of thinking about it we only get one part pie chart we can't have two exactly yeah and I think yeah you know you are ultimately responsible for your own happiness like I really really believe that you know I think it's Mm. you are if you're finding that you're not having a work-life balance you need to do what's within your ability to address that. Yeah. And I think, you know, too many times people don't take responsibility for their own happiness and you can, like, that's the one thing you have control over. So you yeah. have to, you owe it to yourself to do as much yeah. as you can to change that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like we were saying earlier, isn't it? Some people really struggle for ask, asking for help, but I think some people also really struggle to put their hand up and say, hey, this isn't working for me at the moment. What can we do to change this? And again, nine times out of 10, the person you're asking that question to will will probably help you come up with a solution if you don't already have an idea of a solution yourself. Yeah. Completely. Okay. Okay. Ash, as we move towards wrapping up, I love a quote and I'm wondering if you have a quote or expression (laughs) that you could share with us. 
Um, I mean, my all time favorite is that everything happens for a reason. But, you know, I think that one is quite cliched. Um, I heard one actually on a podcast this morning, which mm. I've been thinking about the whole day and I really liked it. Um, so every person that you meet is an education and everything that happens to you is a lesson. And I quite liked that because I've never really thought about every person that you meet being in education. And, you know, what they kind of break this down as is you learn, you know, from them whether you want to emulate something that they're doing or something that they're involved in or, you know, some of their behaviours or you learn from them that they might, again, introduce you to something else or someone else, you know, so that's an education Or you, on the flip side, might realise, oh, gosh, I definitely don't want to be doing this that this person is doing. And so all of it is an education in some aspect. Um, So, yeah, I just I quite like that quote because I never really thought about people like every single interaction that you have with a human being being an education. But it's very true. Yeah, it's very true. Thank you. All right. Well, Ash, this has been an education today. So thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I, like I said, I really, really do mean it. I wish something like this had been around when, you know, I was at university and so confused about what I wanted to do. So I really like applaud you for doing this because I, I think it's going to make a lot of difference to a lot of people. Oh, thank you so much. Are there any final words of wisdom or encouragement you'd like to share with the audience before we go? No, I just think, you know, self-belief, persistence and keep going and just keep throwing those darts and the right one will strike the bullseye when it's meant to. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining Ash and I today. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you gained any value out of today's episode, please share it with your friends and like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, do get in touch with us. We look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, what have you learned or gained from a setback? Have a think about that. Thanks so much. Bye.